All right, about to talk to uh, Dr. Ron Sider uh, on the telephone uh, here in a few minutes here on Signposts. Um, this guy is gutsy, uh, and I, th- I think I may mention uh, later on, uh, he uh, came to an event that I hosted one time and just gave a thorough critique of my view of the death penalty. He's he's sort of in the uh, Anabaptist, uh, uh, peacemaking, um, anti uh, death penalty, anti-war sort of uh, sort of tribe, which is of course uh, different uh, from mine. But I stood in awe of that because of the way that he did it. And I've seen him do it a number of times with with other people, where he really does believe the things that he believes. Uh, and whether I agree with him, which I do on a lot of things, or disagree with him, which I do on some things, uh, he doesn't do it in a belligerent way. So he was one of the few people that when he is disagreeing with me very forcefully on something that he thinks is really important, I sensed Christ-likeness, and I felt like he actually cared about me. You know, that's just a, that's an unusual thing. It's, it's very odd to be in a disagreement with someone where you walk away from it uh, feeling as though you have been spiritually encouraged, even though you weren't persuaded. So that's a unique uh, a unique situation and a unique uh, life of somebody who's been faithful in marriage and faithful in ministry. And I want to uh, learn from him maybe some of the ways that, that God did that, uh, because I don't sense in him bitterness. I don't sense any sort of score settling sometimes you see uh, in in ministry. And I don't sense any sort of uh, pessimism or despair. And so I would like to know how to be that kind of Christian. And so I hope to hope to be able to discover some of that in this conversation. Hello, this is Russell Moore, and you're listening to Signposts. And the guest that I have with us today is uh, Ronald J. Sider, who is the author of Oh, dozens and dozens of uh, books. I don't even know the the number, uh, but a lot of uh, books, uh, including Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger, which was uh, called one of the top 100 books in religion in the 20th uh, century. Uh, He has been uh, president of Evangelicals for Social Action and director of the Cider Center on Ministry and Public Policy and a professor at Palmer uh, Theological Seminary in Philadelphia and is ordained in the Mennonite and Brethren in Christ uh, Churches. And as we are recording this, is about a day or so away from his uh, 80th birthday. And the the reason that I wanted to talk to Ron Sider is uh, I'll just give you uh, a vignette of his life. He he spoke at an event uh, that I hosted. Had a range of uh, different people there speaking on uh, dignity of human life. And I came in and gave a presentation on sanctity of unborn human life and uh, critiqued my position on the death penalty uh, and, and did so uh, very forcefully and very uh, effectively. Uh, but uh, what I admired about that is that he has the, the strength of his convictions, but he also is able to uh, able to come into a setting like that and have uh, differing views sometimes on things that Christians can disagree on in a way that is uh, is persuasive or, or seeks to be uh, persuasive, not simply uh, talking points that are that are bandied back and forth with one another. So I I really have benefited a lot uh, from his writings over the years. But one of the things I wanted to talk about today is not so much about issues, although those are important, uh, but about integrity, uh, because that's one of the things that I admire uh, a great deal about Ron Sider in the same way that I admire uh, the, the, the similar uh, sort of situation with, say, J.I. Packer, is that this is somebody who has lived true to his convictions and isn't a hack. I have seen him uh, take issues, uh, take on uh, issues that would not be popular with uh, what you may say his tribe might be uh, at at any given moment, but uh, out of faithfulness to Jesus and do that in a way that is very joyful and filled with integrity. So, Ron Sider, I'm really honored that you would take the time to talk with us today. Uh, Thank you, Russell. I'm uh, very much appreciative of the courage uh, 
that uh, you uh, demonstrate in uh, trying to follow Jesus. So it's a privilege. I have in front of me right now, and I I thought about, I said, well, I, let me bring down some of my Ron Sider books, but there, there's just like two shelves of them <laughs> up there, and I didn't want to bring all of them down. But I brought down a book that you wrote that I reread, uh, actually for the second time, uh, just a, a, a few weeks ago when I was on vacation, uh, called I Am Not a Social Activist, uh, Making Jesus the Agenda. And the reason for that is because you, uh, you talk at several points in this book about things that you have learned uh, in, in ministry, in marriage, in uh, dealing with, with leading people, in maintaining integrity. I was especially... Uh, impressed by a chapter that you had about sort of temptations uh, that that can come when when it comes to dealing with media, and I, I think there are a lot of of temptations that can come at every point in ministry. When you when you kind of look back over the span of your ministry and what you've learned, when it comes to maintaining integrity, uh, what would you say to someone, uh, a man or woman who maybe is 25 years old, just sort of starting out in serving the Lord, uh, what are some things they should be thinking about now? Uh, someone asked me um, uh, at the end of a speech uh, fairly recently uh, what I would like in my tombstone. Mm. And uh, I said, uh, my wife and I, I think, would like uh, the following. Uh, they tried to live like Jesus. Uh, it, it seems to me that the central thing must be that we're committed to Christ above all. Uh, God knows we're all weak, finite human beings and sinful, and and we fail. Thank God for the forgiveness through the cross. But if our deepest longing is to make Jesus Christ Lord of every part of our lives, you know, that that gives us... um, protection. Uh, My wife and I have had a wonderful marriage, but um, after about 18 or so years of marriage, we went through a very hard time. Uh, And uh, there were even days when I wondered if it would uh, uh, last. Mm -hmm. And what kept us going was, one, we were committed to Jesus as Lord of all of our life and what he said about marriage covenant. Uh, And then we had um, the presence of the risen Lord in our lives as we prayed and praised. We also had a wonderful marriage co- Christian marriage council group for a while. So I, I think the central thing uh, for integrity is at the deepest level of our being to mean uh, that daily we look into the face of the Lord and say, Jesus, help me to live like you today. Mm. How, how should a Christian, I mean, one of the things that you talk a great deal about uh, is, uh, is the poor. And about uh, the, the 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 call that Jesus gives to us repeatedly in the Gospels about remembering the poor, what the Apostle Paul talks about in Galatians uh, Galatians two, uh, the, the the at Jerusalem, the apostles asked me to remember the poor, the very thing that I was was willing to do. Uh, when we think about the situation that we're in in American Christianity, where it's so easy sometimes to try to um, accommodate to a world system that says, calculate how much someone is of value uh, to you in in terms of your relationships. And that can be just in a local church, sort of networking. So you're, you're trying to figure out who who is going to be most important in terms of donations or most important in terms of serving on committees or or what have you, to where it, it can happen really subtly, where you're paying attention to the bank president and you're not giving any thought uh, to the poor person uh, who may be uh, in your community or, or in the congregation. How do you recognize uh, that? How does one recognize that in oneself and and uproot it? Yeah, it's probably easier to quote the scripture which condemns that kind of uh, giving preference to uh, the rich and powerful and Mm. uh, ignoring the weak. Um, I mean, biblically, theologically, it's just totally clear that every person is created in the image of God. Every person is equally loved by God. Every person is equally valuable and important. Uh, But you know, to live that out um, um, is not um, easy. I, I think if one constantly remembers the uh, 
the hundreds and hundreds of verses in the Bible about God's special concern for the poor um, and the biblical truth about every person being equally important in God's sight, that that um, helps one. Uh, but I wouldn't pretend that uh, it's easy to live that out. I, I've had to raise money for evangelicals for social action over uh, four decades, and I uh, wouldn't claim that I always uh, uh, got the priority right that you're uh, pointing to. Mm. When when we when we think about uh, a lot of these uh, pressure points when it comes to to personal integrity to ministry integrity to our civic integrity uh, and so forth, it seems to me a great deal of that comes down to fear. And so uh, you may have um, someone uh, maybe more in in my uh, theological tribe uh, to to put it. Uh, reductionistically, who might uh, who might uh, be very willing to talk about uh, abortion uh, and and those sorts of issues, but really reluctant uh, to maybe talk about uh, our responsibility to the poor. And you may have someone in uh, in an opposite sort of uh, theological tribe that might be just the reverse. A- a- and often that comes down to I don't. Uh, I don't want to be fearful of losing sort of my place in the in the community, and it seems to me a lot of that comes down to that. How does one in following Jesus uh, deal with that sense of of fear and insecurity, and and what are people going to think of me uh, as we're trying to be faithful to Him? Yeah, I, I think the uh, the bottom line is: uh, Do we really mean that Jesus is Lord? Do we really mean that? Uh, I'm going to seek to be faithful to Jesus as Lord, no matter whether or not that makes me popular or not with this or that person. And the uh, the other is, um, are we committed to what the Bible tells us? Um, and uh, throughout my life, I've, I've tried to say that I'd like to be faithful to the whole scripture. Uh, I'd like to have the balance of concerns in my life, whether it's sanctity of um, of human life um, or um, or conservative view on marriage, or justice for the poor, or peacemaking, or caring for creation. I'd like to uh, let the biblical balance shape what I do and say, but bottom line is one simply has to decide whether or not uh, one is going to be faithful to all that the scriptures say. I think there's a real sense that the question is is truly, do we really mean that Jesus is our Lord? If we're willing to let um, powerful people around us um, shape what we say and what we focus on rather than Jesus in the scriptures, then finally we're abandoning Jesus and the scriptures and we're denying Jesus Christ as our Lord. Mm. One of the things that I've noticed uh, when it comes to integrity, and, and this this comes right down to a conversation that I had uh, yesterday, is uh, talking to younger uh, Christians who are sometimes really thrown uh, when they look at um, Christians they admired uh, in their lives and their ministries who maybe have fallen morally or uh, they look back, uh, for instance, at Christians in history, and uh, they see uh, George Whitfield uh, owning slaves, uh, for instance, or, or other uh, integrity issues with Christians that they, they admired a great deal. You have, uh, over the course of your ministry, worked with uh, virtually every high-profile uh, Christian leader that one could, could possibly think of uh, in, in a variety of different denominations. And so how, how would you, because when I'm talking to younger Christians, I find myself uh, sort of encouraging them, and yet I know exactly what they're talking about, because over time, I have found myself with people uh, that, I, that meant a great deal to me uh, in my life, that I, I really saw as spiritually mature and, and holy and, and filled with integrity. And then it all comes crashing down, and it can be really disillusioning. So, how do we, how do we continue to have confidence in Jesus when the church sometimes is involved in some some awful things, and individual Christian leaders sometimes uh, are demonstrating a lack of integrity? Yeah, it simply makes one weep. I mean, I, I feel deeply sad when uh, Christian leaders, that um, in some cases, I greatly admired. Um, have obviously failed uh, failed terribly. Um, 
thank God for uh, people like Billy Graham uh, mm-hmm. and John Stott, just to name mm-hmm. two people who, um, you know, throughout their life lived with uh, amazing integrity and in very influential positions. And, and there are there are many more. Uh, you know, one certainly uh, wants to be ready to forgive. Uh, we all know that. Uh, we're imperfect, that uh, we haven't reached full sanctification. And so in smaller or larger ways, all of us uh, sometimes feel our Lord. Uh, but it's simply the case that when Christian leaders um, fail to live what Jesus calls us to live, um, it's a disgrace to the gospel. I sometimes say, that it's um, since the gospel is not just forgiveness of sins, although thank God it's that, but the gospel is the good news of the kingdom, and, the, and that messianic kingdom is breaking into history. And now we have the power of the risen Lord you know, to live the way Jesus said his disciples in that new messianic kingdom should live. Um, and since that's the gospel, then when Christians fail to live what Jesus taught, the Christian church is, in a sense, evidence against the truth of the gospel, mm. which is so sad. I I grieve with younger people, um, and I think we just must um, uh, pray and beg God to help us. Uh, Pete Hammond used to say uh, when he met me, uh, his wonderful evangelical leader, um, uh, finish well, Ron. Uh, mm. And he was saying, you know, uh, don't don't commit some big sin at this point in your life. Uh, live with integrity. And uh, I, I've tried to do that. Um, certainly not perfectly. Well, and even uh, sometimes with uh, one of the things that I fear is uh, is not just sort of a, a big uh, moral failing like that, but also a sense of um, of growing into a kind of bitterness and cynicism. I, I've seen that happen too in in ministry, and mm. it certainly seems to me that uh, you, by God's grace, have been able to avoid that. I'm sure that you have seen your share of disappointments in life and, and ministry, and yet you seem to uh, have maintained joyfulness and um, and a sense of, of hope. Is that just? something the Spirit did and you don't know how, or, or are there are there ways that, that you cultivated that? Yeah, uh, I'm not sure that I really uh, have a good answer to that. I, I think that uh, one part of the answer is that I, um, I, I'm absolutely convinced that Jesus of Nazareth was alive on the third day, mm. uh, and that... Um, uh, the risen Lord now is present in anyone who seeks to walk with him and provides power and strength to uh, to live the way he calls us to live. And so a longing to do that uh, uh, certainly has been an important part of, uh, of, of my life. Um, when I you know, work hard at something and, and fail. Uh, sometimes I feel that I've worked hard uh, for a long time uh, in the evangelical community and I uh, uh, haven't succeeded very well. And when I when that happens, I, I say, uh, I know that how this works out in the end. Mm. Uh, I know who's in charge of history. I know where history is going. Uh, Jesus uh, is Lord of the universe. Uh, as Revelation said, he's now ruler of the kings of the earth. And in the end, he's going to return and finish the victory. So just knowing that that's the way it will end because Jesus is Lord um, has also helped. Mm. Well, you have been very involved in American evangelicalism, of course. And one of the things that uh, that I'm asked often, especially on college campuses or, or seminary campuses, is from younger born-again Christians who will say, why do we use the word evangelical? Uh, now uh, it, it tends to just mean a political category or an economic category, or it's confusing uh, to people. And so when, they, when the, the evangelical fellowship at the the campus uh, comes, people don't expect to hear about Jesus. They expect to hear about some cultural argument or so forth. Uh, do you think evangelical is a word worth keeping, or should we find an alternative? 
I certainly understand why people in the last couple of years, uh, uh, especially younger um, evangelicals, are asking that question with uh, uh, great pain and uh, and uncertainty. Um, I did a piece um, that uh, Christianity Today published, um, I think, in their online, uh, uh, maybe uh, late 2016. I'm not sure exactly when it was. Uh, and said, uh, evangelical, when I use the word evangelical, I go back and ask, when were the times when um, large numbers of Christians wanted to use that word? Um, and the first, of course, um, is uh, the Protestant Reformation. Uh, the Lutheran Church in Germany is the evangelische Kirche, the evangelical church. And it meant especially the scripture alone and uh, grace alone. We, we don't get saved by good works, and the Bible is our final authority. Um, I believe that. Uh, the second great time was in the uh, the Wesleyan Revival, the Evangelical Revival. It meant a passion for evangelism, um, and it meant a deep personal faith, not just a kind of um, dry uh, uh, faith. Um, the whole worldwide mission movement uh, uh, grew out of uh, that time period. Uh, I'm committed to all of that. Uh, and the third time uh, was, um, you know, the beginning of the 20th century, the fundamentalist social gospel movement, when uh, some of the church um, uh, really developed liberal theology and evangelicals said, uh, it matters if you believe that Jesus is true God and true man, that mm-hmm. he's the only way to salvation, that he rose bodily from the dead. Uh, and so, again, I affirm that. And when I say I'm an evangelical, I, I mean those basic affirmations from those three moments um, when the word evangelical was widely used by large numbers of Christians. I still am committed to that. Uh, I think the word is um, too good to abandon it to um, uh, political people who've uh, distorted what it means. And rooted, of course, in that word is uh, good news, the word for good news, which uh, I think all of us need to be reminded of. Yes. Well, thank you, uh, Ron Sider. I'm I'm really grateful to be able to have this conversation uh, with you today, and uh, thankful for your uh, your witness and your life and your work. And um, I'm just really grateful to be able to talk to you. Thank you, Russell. Uh, uh, we don't always agree on everything, but I really deeply respect uh, your courage, integrity, and what you're doing in the church. God bless you. And I, you, thank you. This is Russell Moore, and you're listening to Signposts.